just because of the um, fairly sudden venue change. So if you would just bear with us for five minutes, then hopefully less, we're just sorting things out. Thank you. Well, I want to check that it's here, and can I have a so clicker? you'll be able to actually see it no, there. But, no, but I need a clicker. Yeah, but, no, I can see that, but I need my own sequence here to know what's coming next, but I need the clicker. No, no worries. I'll just get you the clicker. I'll just get you the clicker. Yes, can I leave that there? Do you need... Do you no, need I need to actually announce, her, and I'll just place okay. it there. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, we request you again and again to please put your cell phones on silent. If any of your neighbors or your friends are talking on phone, please ask them to go outside and finish the remaining conversation. Uh, also, if you have any social media content to be shared, remember to use the hashtag ZJLF. There will be a Q&A at the end of the session, so please hold on to your questions for the same. And the moderator will point out who the question will be asked to, so please wait for your turn. Uh, I would now like to announce our session for today, which is Shakespeare Restless World. We have Neil McGregor, introduced by Tim Supple. Thank you very much. Thank you for finding us. Thank you to the brilliant volunteers here for organizing the change of venue. Um, it's, it's a great joy for me to be back here for the third time. And, and more than anything else, I have just half an hour ago had a pleasure, which you will now have. For the first time I've met Neil, I've grown up with, as an adult, Neil's work. I've been a great admirer. Meeting Neil for the first time half an hour ago was, was for me, the beginning of, of what uh, is, is a special encounter. And that's what it's all about. We're not here just to hear people talking and to put our brains to sleep and just have confirmed what we thought we already know or just ignore what we're hearing and block it off. We're here to learn something. We're here to receive something. We're here to, to share an idea. And um, I think Neil is one of those people who can communicate things that feel, ah, yes, yes, that's right, I recognize that, but I hadn't thought of it in that way. Neil is an illuminator, and just, you, you, I don't need to introduce him biographically, you can check on Wikipedia nowadays, you've got your biographies in there, but just to say, for me personally, the thing about Neil, 
Neil's work in London um, is that, as many of you probably know, he ran the National Gallery for a very long time and completely transformed that place, um, which was always was a, a strong and important institution. But something happened to the National Gallery, which I just took for granted. It was over quite a long period, 87 to 2002. Um, what really shook me and I was awake to is what Neil did at the British Museum, which, which was transformed from an, a rather august and distant institution into somewhere that really revealed the world to you in different and extraordinary and new ways. There's a kind of worldwide fashion now for what we call the blockbuster exhibition, and Neil started that, but not by trying to make blockbusters, by trying to really give us something big and important that came from elsewhere, and he made those things clear. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Neil McGregor, who is going to talk to us for about 40 minutes about Shakespeare in a way that uh, I don't think we will have experienced before in its simplicity and clarity and importance. So, ladies and gentlemen, Neil McGregor. Tim, thank you very much, and may I join Tim in thanking the volunteers for moving not just you from the front lawn to here, but also, I hope, my presentation. Uh, so if we could start with the presentation, please, that would be kind. Uh, can we have the beginner? Shall I try? We, no, nothing's happening. Can, can, there we are. Yes, thank you. Uh, what I want to try to do today is to talk about Shakespeare's public. As you all know, we know very little about Shakespeare himself. There's very little information. It's hardly worth speculating. What we can know is a great deal about Shakespeare's public. And what I want to talk about is what were the people who first saw these plays and what did they have in their heads? And why that matters is because Shakespeare himself talks about it so much. He, there's no scenery, as you know, in a Shakespeare play. The audience have to bring the scenery with them. He says at the beginning of Henry V, when the chorus speaks to the audience, piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. People will appear, you've got to imagine they're kings, you've got to think what is the king. You've got to make the people real. You've got to make the place real. So what was in their heads when it happened. The first thing, of course, is London. They're all in London. London in the 1590s is a middle-sized city. By far the biggest city in Europe is still Istanbul. The center of the world economically is still Istanbul, Cairo, Baghdad, and India. Uh, London right on the edge, but getting richer, and getting richer above all because of the river and the trading and London is becoming, for the first time, connected with the rest of the world in the 1580s. And on the edge of that river, as I hope you can see somewhere, the theater of the globe. On the south side of the river, that's the side nearest you as you're looking at this image, is where the theaters are. All the smart bit of London is in the north. If you want to have a night out, if you want to do things you don't want your parents to know about, you come to the south. You cross the river and you have fun, and that's where the theatres are. And the theatre, as you know, looks something like this. And this is, I think, an important point to make. The 1590s, theatres are a totally new idea in Britain, a public theatre. The first public theatre is invented, really, in the 1570s. So this is new. It's a new kind of entertainment. It's like the cinema in the 1920s. It's somewhere you can go that nobody went before. It's, somebody, it's a place that's constructed for a new kind of entertainment. And what I really want to focus on is, imagine you were born the same year as Shakespeare, 1564, that you are a generation that is more cut off from your parents than any generation, I think, previously in the history of the world. You are dislocated from your past in a way that we may feel dislocated from our past because of the internet, because of all kinds of other things. You are living in a new world with no guidance. And you are coming to this new kind of theater, 
a new kind of space where you will see a new kind of entertainment. And it's not, uh, you all know that the, it's been reconstructed as the globe. If, you, if you've been there, you can see roughly uh, what it was like. Uh, open theatre uh, on the edge of the river. And because this is the bit where you come to have fun, theatres are not just for plays. They're also places where you have sword fights, which is the equivalent of wrestling or boxing matches. So when there's no play on, you watch people fighting. So when you see people fighting with swords in a Shakespeare play, they're probably, some of them, the same people who've been giving you demonstration sword matches earlier in the, in the week. Uh, you also come because it's where you get bear baiting. When we excavated the theaters in the south, they found that's a bear's skull, um, as you can see, or maybe can't see. You might not have recognized it's a bear's skull, but we found the bones of the bears and the dogs that baited them. This is not a polite society, this is rough. Uh, you come to watch people fight, you come to watch animals be baited and teased, and then you come to watch plays. And you come into a space organized like this, theater, stage in the middle, banks of seats, and in front of the stage, places where you stand uh, if you're poor. Because the great thing to remember about this is that you are paying to come to this theater. This is not a theater like you find on the continent in France or in Italy, which is the theater of the king or the duke or the prince. This is the public's theater, and you pay. It's commercial theater, and everybody is in this theater. So as you make your way to Shakespeare's theater, one of the things you've got is you've got your money. Not very much, and it's collected from you at the door. This is one of the very few surviving collecting boxes. If you're standing, it's a penny, uh, and it's more if you're sitting, and depending where you sit, the more you pay. At the end of the performance, this, bo this box, uh, this uh, little gathering uh, money box gets broken, and all the money is put into a box, a proper wooden box. That's why we call it the box office. And uniquely, uniquely, Shakespeare is a shareholder in his own theater. Most playwrights don't make any money. As writers, you've probably heard many times this week uh, complaining, writers don't make money. Most playwrights didn't. Shakespeare did, because Shakespeare has shares in the theater. So this is a very important bit of Shakespeare's world, but it's a commercial theater, and it's not by any means just for the rich. If you pay a penny, everyone can come, and that's not a great deal of money. And that means that standing in the, in the pit where the groundlings stand, you have people wearing clothes like this. This is the hat you had to wear if you were an apprentice. Uh, you had to wear certain kinds of hats in Elizabethan England, and the hat showed your status. And that's why when, uh, when Hamlet goes mad, that he's not wearing a hat is very concerning. You know where people stand, and a woolen hat was obligatory clothing. It was also very good for the wool industry, so the MPs representing wool constituencies had lobbied for it. But it let everybody know your status. And when in Coriolanus, they talk about the greasy caps of the mob and the populace, the actor speaking, it was looking down on greasy caps, just like that one. So some of you would have been paying a penny, wearing a cap like that, and standing um, in the pit. And what do you do? You come to the theater, it's two o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock, there's no artificial lighting, so it has to be in the daytime, and you, are, of course, hungry. So one of the things you want to do in the theater is eat, just like today. Excavations have produced this amazing amount of stuff dropped by the public in Shakespearean theaters. And what you're looking at is the food of the poor. The, if you're standing, if you're in the cheap seats, you eat shellfish, above all, oysters, winkles, cockles and you eat nuts and fruit. All of them have been found because these theaters kept burning down, which is very useful for archeologists uh, because uh, everything gets trapped and stuck. And this is, I think, really important for what it's like to watch a Shakespeare play. 
As you're standing or sitting, trying to listen for the first time to Hamlet, somebody next to you is opening an oyster. Somebody else is going around selling nuts. And, of course, people are also selling beer. Beer in bottles that uh, don't work very well. There are complaints by uh, playwrights about the noise of fizzy beer when bottles open. You drink the beer, you're eating this all the way through the great poetry that you know. And then, of course, what do you do when you've drunk your beer? Well, that's very difficult. Um, we know that men just went into the corners. And that's it's quite important to remember when you think of Shakespeare's high poetry. Women, well, women, of course, are much too refined. Uh, so either they didn't drink enough or they brought special little bottles with them. We know that's what they did for very long sermons in church, and we would imagine they must have done the same here. But this is pretty rough stuff. You're not in a smart theater today. And these are the people Shakespeare is writing for. Shakespeare is writing for the people eating the nuts and the shellfish. He's eating with the pe writing for the people paying a penny. But they're also the rich. And we know that also from the archaeology. Because as well as finding this kind of material, showing the poor in the theater, we also found uh, this. It's, now, this is one of the smartest things you could have in London in 1600. It's a fork, as you can see. Uh, and it's a fork on the, with a little brass handle, a uh, knob at the top, and on the top, uh, of it are the initials A.N., showing that it belonged to a particular person. We don't know who A.N. is, but this is a very, very expensive implement. The British had only just discovered the fork, and they were very excited. They'd seen it in Italy, uh, and they were amazed by the refinement that the Italians could use a fork and therefore eat without getting dirty. And so the smart Londoner of 1590s would have a fork, a very expensive object. It's made of iron, wood, and brass, and with the name on it. And it must have been dropped by accident because we know that when you went to the theater, the people in the first two, or th the people you can see there would all be eating what was sold by people walking around. The rich were sitting in boxes, effectively, near the stage. And if you were rich, you brought your own food, just like a picnic at the opera in Glyndebourne or whatever, and you brought your own cutlery. And somebody must have been very, very irritated to drop this fork and lose it. But it's a demonstration that this is a kind of public that had never existed before. The whole of society is in this theater. And that, of course, is why the whole of society is on the stage. If you've paid to be in the theater, you want to see people like you on the stage. And that's what makes this completely new. There's never been, there wasn't a theater before that you could compare with it, and it's a theater very much like television in the 1960s or 1970s. A new mass audience, the whole of society, and you're all together in this place. You get there only two ways from where most of you live in the north. If you're, uh, you can take the little ferry across the river, um, which is what uh, we know a lot of people did, or you can walk over London Bridge, which you can see behind. There's the only London Bridge. There's only one bridge or lots of little boats. So it's quite an expedition to get there. And as I say, what is, I think, worth now thinking about is what are you, you've got yourself there, you know you're going to be able to eat, drink, you'll then go on and have more fun in the pubs and the brothels round about the theatres. Um, it's a great place for the lads' night out, and if you're smarter, of course, you'll come by your own boat and leave by your own boat. But as I say, you are a generation that has all kinds of new experiences, you think about the world differently. And to start with just one simple thing, the domestic clock. 
There is no domestic clock, really, in England until the 1570s. There are public clocks, of course, that strike bells, lots of them. But the clock in your house is a new development. And they're mostly made by people from Flanders or Germany. In Love's Labour is Lost, uh, one of the characters says that buying a wife is like buying a proper German clock. Um, it's very expensive, very high maintenance, and will never do quite what you expect. Um, but the clock, in the, the fact that that can be said, shows that a lot of the richer part of the audience would have clocks at home. Shakespeare certainly would have. What that means is that you are the first, first generation ever to hear the ticking of a clock, because this is a pendulum clock. The noise of time has changed. You can hear a minute. No generation previously had ever been able to hear a minute or less or a second. And all those passages in Shakespeare about the last syllable of recorded time, Richard II comparing himself to a clock, these are new experiences. You can think about time as something much, much more precise and much closer to you in which you're living. You are in a new world, not just technologically with the clock, you are also, of course, in a completely new world religiously. Your parents, if you were born in 1564, your parents grew up uh, with the habit of Roman Catholic Latin Mass. There had been a Reformation, but it failed. Mary brought back the, 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 the Latin Mass. And then there's the final Reformation, and you live with ruins of the great religious monasteries. This is Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire. But right across England, people are living with the ruins of the great monastic houses, the monasteries, the abbeys, which had been not just dissolved, but left to fall to pieces. It's a new religious world, and it's imposed by violence and brutality. And every one of you in the audience will have had the experience of being brought up hearing the Bible in English, hearing your religious service in English, but your grandmother will still say her prayers in Latin. Your grandmother will still cross herself because that's what she's always done. She'll still use a rosary because that's what she's always done. And in Hamlet, it's worth noticing that the older generation say things like, by the mass. Hamlet, the older generation, talk about, talk in language of the Roman Catholic Church. The young don't. You are cut off from a whole world that your parents had lived with and grown up with, which had shaped England for at least 800 years. A huge disruption, and one that you're conscious of every day. And you are the first people ever to drink communion wine at the weekly service. This is the chalice, the communion cup, from Shakespeare's church. Every church had to have one. Previously, only the priest drank the wine. Now, in the Protestant world, the laity do. Everybody does. And you have to, because if you don't drink it, it may mean that you are actually Catholic, and may mean, therefore, that you are not a loyal subject to the queen. You are drinking the wine for the first time. You are a new Protestant generation. And it's very dangerous not to be a Protestant. And this, I think, is really critical. This is a society that is in a state of violent religious war. Uh, it's a more or less constant war with Spain as the great Catholic power. But inside England, there are still people who want to be Catholic. And it's a crime to be a Jesuit in England. It's a crime to celebrate the Catholic communion. And one of the most extraordinary discoveries of recent years in a house in Lancashire was this peddler's trunk. It's a trunk used, the sort used by, uh, by, by peddlers as they went around the country selling 
uh, bits of fabric and material. But when it was opened up, it was discovered that it's not really to sell little bits of lace and satin and silk. It's actually a secret kit for a priest to celebrate the Roman Catholic Mass. So he went around pretending to sell lace and whatever, and then what he actually did was celebrate Mass in your house. And this shows how important disguise is. You're living in a country where people around you disguise themselves in order to do something illegal. You all know from the Shakespeare plays how much disguise matters. And these Catholics, the Catholics who don't like the Protestant Reformation, the Catholics who are not willing to be a Protestant, who are not willing to support a Protestant monarchy, keep plotting to kill the king, the queen, and then the king. All through Elizabeth's reign, there are conspiracies to kill the monarch, to assassinate the monarch. And this, so your reality is that you are living in a world where constantly you're told that someone is trying to poison the queen, to stab the queen, and indeed people are killed because of it. And what you're looking at is the lantern that Guy Fawkes carried when he went to Parliament to blow up not just the king, but the whole of the British Parliament um, in 1605. This is a violent society where people are prepared to kill and assassinate for religion. This had not happened before. This is a new phenomenon. It's something that should be very close to us. And it's something that, of course, changes the way you understand the plays, the killing of the monarch, the killing of the king, Julius Caesar, whatever, Richard II. This is something that's happening now in your town. And when the traitors get caught, these are the traitors that tried to blow up Parliament and kill the king. What happens if you try to kill the king and get caught is, of course, very bloody indeed. You get executed. And this is a picture I do want you to look at carefully. An execution is a public entertainment. There's a stage, huge stage, a scaffold, and on that, as you can see, the traitors are lined up and then they are hanged and then disemboweled in front of you. Huge crowds gather round it, but there's also a convention that before the man is killed, he can speak to the public. He can make a final statement. So the idea of talking about your execution is a very public thing, but the bloodiness of looking at the uh, execution is something that Shakespeare's public would have been very used to. This happens on the north side of the river. You could go to an execution in the morning and go to a theater in the afternoon. You could look at somebody who had actually tried to kill the king or the queen in the morning and somebody planning to kill Richard II or Julius Caesar in the afternoon. And when people come onto Shakespeare's stage with severed heads or whatever, you've seen that. This is part of your life. And it matters because the only guarantor of safety is the queen, the king, monarchy. If you, don't, if you lose the king, chaos, as you can see in Julius Caesar, as you can see throughout. When, you're, when you've been executed, then very interesting things happen. One Jesuit priest was executed completely wrongly for the gunpowder plot, trying to blow up James VI. A relic has survived. This silver box, which is about that size, contains, when you turn it round, the eye of a Jesuit priest. After he had been executed, his body was thrown away, his head was thrown away, some loyal Catholic preserved the eye and kept it as a relic to remind you of what people were prepared to suffer for the faith. This is the world in which when you come as a member of the theater public to watch Gloucester's eye being taken out in King Lear, which we all find so shocking, so appalling, as unimaginable, 
It's not unimaginable for Shakespeare's first public. This level of public brutality is very, very present. And these are people who have chosen to be a martyr. We are now very puzzled, often, by voluntary martyrdom. Shakespeare's public were not at all puzzled. They knew that's what people who really believed did. And it's played out in blood for everybody. And once you've been executed, your head is then put on a spike. And the spikes are put on London Bridge. So as you walk to the theater, you walk past heads on spikes. This is why I think it's really important to remember this. So all those things, the number of times people come on to the stage in Shakespeare carrying somebody's severed head, sometimes with two of them, um, which this is actually part of daily life. This is not our world, but this is also not the world of your parents. This is a new world, dangerous, threatened, and unimaginably complex, with people working against you, dressing up, concealing, all the things that find in the plays are happening round about you. But there's another way in which you, your world is different from your parents, completely. You are the first generation ever to be able to think of the world as round. And the globe, this is a globe made in London, it's the first globe made in London in 1572. And this, I think, is really extraordinary. At no previous point in history, when you thought of the world, could you imagine the world like this. And when Shakespeare calls his theater the globe, it's like calling it the internet. This is a totally new way of imagining humanity. And, the, and it's, for the English, it's a very, very important one. That link with the globe and the globe of the theater is extraordinary because just as the globe atlases are called Teatro Mundi, theaters of the world, in the globe, Shakespeare will show you the world. You go to the globe, you go into another world. And that world was a particularly interesting one for the English because only two people, when Shakespeare is writing in the 1590s, had ever sailed around the world. One was Magellan, the Spaniard. The second was Francis Drake. So the English had kept up with the Spanish in the space race of the 16th century and sailed around the world. And very briefly, I want to show you this silver disc. It's, um, it's about that high thin silver disc showing the world that Francis Drake sailed round. As you can, I hope, make out, um, you have one hemisphere on one side and one hemisphere on the other. And the map, the map takes you round, a little dotted line showing how Drake moved uh, south across the Atlantic, round Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. And very, very importantly, he discovered that you could get between Tierra del Fuego and the Pacific. He came up the west coast of South America uh, and in Peru stopped to raid the Spanish galleons and steal all the silver. And this silver disc is made from stolen Spanish silver, which makes it really thrilling. It's not just silver from America, it's silver we've stolen from the Spaniards in America. Um, this is a very greedy society. It's a society driven by greed and, and curiosity and exploration. Drake sails on uh, up the West Coast and then across uh, uh, sort of back um, across uh, to, to uh, India, the Spice Islands, picks up some spice on the way, and then uh, 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 sort of up, up the coast of uh, Africa um, uh, and comes uh, back to uh, London. He comes back inordinately rich. Uh, the spices have made him hugely rich. Uh, the people who backed him 
uh, have made huge profits. The queen is a shareholder, and she doubles her annual income on the proceeds of this return. So exploring the world, the globe, is about money, it's about curiosity, and it's the first time ever that you can think about the whole world. This is the moment at which globalization really begins. And it's the first time London becomes a global city. What it means, and that's what Shakespeare is so concerned with, you are fascinated because you are seeing in London things you've never seen before. You're discovering a world that you never knew existed and that suddenly you can sail to, you can get to, because you're doing things that other countries aren't. The country you most want to go to, of course, is always Italy, Venice. This is the smart country. Every society has a moment, a city, that they project as the ideal fantasy city. In the 19th century, it's Paris. The 20th century, it was New York. For Shakespeare's London, it's Venice. Venice is where there's luxury, there's pleasure, everything is available. Sex is better there, there's more of it. Everything is better and you want it. That's where the forks come from, it's where smart food comes from, it's where smart dress comes from, and you want to be there as much as you possibly can. That's why all the plays, so many of the plays, have reference to Venice. Venice is very present, lots of trade, lots of contact. But there's a new world that's also suddenly come home. Your great ally against Spain is Morocco, and this is the king of Morocco. King of Morocco, great ally of Elizabeth against the Spaniards. And the King of Morocco regularly sends uh, embassies to London. And what everybody knows about Morocco is that that's where the gold comes from. Every gold coin in England is minted from gold, with gold from Morocco. Uh, it is the only source of gold you can get. And we have one wonderful uh, shipwreck hoard filled with Moroccan gold, clearly being brought back. The Moroccans make gold, and the English buy gold in return for, well, the English didn't have very much to sell except wool and trees. So what they tended to do was steal silver from the Spaniards and then buy gold from the Moroccans. And that's why, of course, in The Merchant of Venice, when the Prince of Morocco has to make his choice, everybody knows which casket he's going to choose is going to be the gold one. The moor is suddenly present. Black people are in London for the first time. Uh, Elizabeth welcomes them. The public don't like them. But the black Christian is perfectly present. And this kind of portrait showing uh, an African wearing a hat badge with the Virgin Mary on it shows very clearly that we're in the world of Othello a world where the black Christian is there, but you don't like them. It's a racist view of Othello. He's got thick lips. He's having sex with white women. In fact, only one white woman called Desdemona, obviously. But the myth is created. This is, and this is actual in London. You have seen Moroccans in London, and most of you want them to go home. Um, and that, of course, is why it's so easy for uh, those insinuations about Othello to be made. Venice, Africa, there's not much beyond. Although Shakespeare does, has early on become a great part of Indian history, this is wonderful production of Othello in Kolkata in 1919. There's no real connection, as you know, between Shakespeare and India. The East India Company is founded, but it's much smaller than the company dealing with Morocco, and is mostly concerned with spices from further east. But there is, of course, in The Midsummer Night's Dream, and Tim Supple did the brilliant, brilliant uh, production of The Midsummer Night's Dream in India, that wonderful moment where Titania says that the mother of the Indian boy who she's adopted was Indian, when Titania was in India. And they watched the ships like this, and laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big bellied with the wanton wind. And then the mother, who was a friend of Titania's, gives birth to the boy and dies. And Titania, remember, adopts the Indian boy and brings him back. 
and the whole squabble is about the Indian boy uh, because of her conversations on the spiced Indian air. And that notion, this is a wonderful 19th century representation of Titania with the Indian boy at the heart of, uh, of, of the Midsummer Night's Dream. I want to finish with Shakespeare now and Shakespeare and India in a slightly different context because this week, for the first time ever, the first folio, uh, that 1622 gathering of Shakespeare's plays, is in Mumbai. It's going on show for several months on loan from the British Library. And it is the first time this Shakespeare has come to India. But Shakespeare and India has, I think, one very, very fascinating link. And that is what is called the Robben Island Bible. Because, as many of you will know, uh, Sonny Vincent Trathnam, who was one of the great freedom fighters of South Africa, in prison in Robben Island with Nelson Mandela, with Walter Sisulu, they weren't allowed books. And he desperately wanted a book. The book he wanted was Shakespeare, that would keep him alive with his thoughts. And so he got his wife to wrap up the complete works of Shakespeare with Diwali cards. And he told the guards that it was his Hindu Bible, and he needed it for his prayers and his conscience. And he was allowed to have it. And this was a critical part of life in Robben Island Prison. And before they left, he got the various leaders to write in the side, in, in the book, mark a passage they particularly admired. And Nelson Mandela chose the passage from Julius Caesar, saying, the coward tastes of many deaths. The valiant only die but once. That idea that if you believe in something, you must be ready to die for it. The coward dies many times before his death. The valiant only taste of death but once signed by Nelson Mandela in the Shakespeare Hindu Bible uh, in Robben Island. It's a wonderful demonstration of Shakespeare speaking to everybody at all times, in all places. It's a wonderful demonstration of what that meant in Shakespeare's time, which is the willingness to die on the scaffold, the willingness to be martyred for what you believe, uh, and which has gone on meaning so many different things. Um, the first folio, as I said, is going to be in the CSMVS, the museum in Mumbai, uh, from tomorrow. And it is, I think, a very interesting, fitting link uh, with the globe. It is Shakespeare becoming global, the globe assuming its real, proper form. And later this year, the British Museum will be presenting in Mumbai an exhibition presenting Indian history in the context of world history, with Indian objects coming from Indian collections from Mumbai, and the British Museum providing objects from the rest of the world. It's an attempt to show that that globalizing, which began in the 16th century, has remained a constant of our life. As our world changes, as we keep being dislocated from our past, Shakespeare's approach, Shakespeare's ideas, are even more accessible to us now, perhaps, than they were then. And I want to finish with uh, the, uh, one of the images that will be in the exhibition, which needs no uh, explanation to you, but a wonderful image about Shakespeare as a global figure speaking to everybody, which appeared in the Toronto Globe and Mail of Shakespeare Nataraj. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was um, wonderful. Of course, I'm going to put on my cap to show my solidarity with the working people in the pit. Also, I live south of the river in London amongst all the bear baiting and theatres and uh, brothels. So, 
I stand proud. And uh, I just want to say it's very moving for me to listen to Neil and watch him live. You know, when I was growing up, I don't know how you feel or felt about museums. Objects in museums I found quite dead. Neil has done something radical in in my time and where I live, in terms of this, this extraordinary way he stepped out of the museum, out of the gallery, and he uses objects to bring the world alive, which of course, that's how it should be, and I found that very moving to, to witness that. He's done that on the radio, he's done it on TV, he's done it in books, which are of course on sale, but just to see that and hear that is a wonderful thing. And as a theater director, I get very bored when actors or audiences um, or academics uh, waft on with words and words and words. We can all talk and talk and talk about Shakespeare. Of course, that's the wonderful thing. We can all say what we think it means, but you've got to get grounded somewhere. And I found that incredibly helpful to begin to understand exactly what he wrote, where it came from, where, what, it, what it was as a concrete thing. And until we do that, anything we say is random and meaningless. We have to find the root, and Neil is helping us do that. In, now, in terms of Shakespeare, that's a gift. So, we have, I'd say, about 15 minutes. Questions, uh, thoughts, uh, mostly questions, I think. I'm gonna maybe take a couple, two or three questions, and, and then let Neil decide which and how he wants to deal. So, we have a microphone. We'll start with the young gentleman right in front with the beard, whose hand was, was first up, I'd say. Try and keep the questions brief if you can. 15 minutes needs a bit of democracy in terms of airspace, please. Hey, thank you. Your work has been extraordinary, both of you. And uh, the question I had was on this idea of the disguise, right? So uh, one of the ways in which disguise operated was because on the Elizabethan stage, you didn't allow women. So the female characters were played by men in disguise. Now I was wondering how this gets complicated when you have characters like Rosalind, or uh, uh, Viola, who are women disguised as men, who are then seducing other men on the stage. So you're essentially seeing an act of homosexuality being performed in this Elizabethan era. So I was wondering what that would look like for the audience. Great question. Disguise, women becoming men, and men, men seeming to fall in love with men, and how that would play to an Elizabethan mind? That's a really good question. I think we should just take that one. Do you yes, uh, I think everybody knew exactly what was going on, obviously. And I think Shakespeare plays with this, especially in As You Like It. I mean, the very title, As You Like It, um, <laughs> where you know, the, uh, is, I think, telling you something. And as you see, you've got a boy playing Rosalind who then dresses as a, Rosalind who in the play is a woman, who then dresses as a man, and at the end pretends to be a woman. And then right at the end, she, the boy, says to all the men in the audience that she'd like to kiss them and would they like to kiss her. Um, of course they know what's going on. Um, uh, it's quite clear that there is, uh, uh, that there is a, 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 a gay culture around the theatre. We know that. Um, I don't think I can make too much of it, but I think the, 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 the game is a very conscious one and it's treated with great humor. And I think we can link that with what Neil taught us about disguise and the Catholics needing to be disguised. It, it, it's playful, yes, but of course, open homosexuality would have been as difficult and dangerous as in, as in many other times. So it had to be a game. And there is something about survival. Disguise is always survival uh, in life and, and on stage. Another one, yes, the, 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 the young lady, yes, you with your hand up there, yes, thank you. Hi, I really enjoyed the session. I just wanted to ask, uh, would you class, sh class Shakespeare's stories as history or historical fiction? <laughs> um, they're, they're definitely historical fiction. Um, what is interesting is that when the theaters start, the commercial ones, the big money spinners of the 1580s are about English history. And I think that's really interesting. You've got a, you've got a country that is fighting, in a sense, for its survival. It's broken with Rome, it's fighting Spain, and all the histories are about you know, heroic little us against beastly others, um, which is particularly good if you're not doing very well, um, as they weren't. Um, uh, but it's also, I think, very much uh, always seeing history as uh, where you can look at what we're going on. You weren't allowed to talk in public about what would happen if Elizabeth died without a child or there was an assassination. So you can't ask the question directly, 
But if you talk about Julius Caesar, you really can, or about Richard II. So it's more than historical fiction. It's, it's history as, a, as, 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 a, as something that allows you to discuss what, is not, what cannot be discussed. And don't, don't miss this point, because it's so crucial that Shakespeare's work comes out of a time of intense danger. Most of the great theatre cultures in the modern world came out of times of danger. The Russian theatre, which is now one of the greatest in the world, of course cut its teeth during the Soviet era, where similarly, new plays were terrible. The public couldn't be bothered with them, because if you went to a new play, you'd only get lies. It was only the old plays through which the directors and the actors could tell the truth and talk about what was real. And that, there's not a dissimilarity with that, I is there? I think it's very, very, very similar. I mean, the, it's an interesting point that the great theatre always appears to come at moments of political shift, change. I mean, when society, one society disintegrates and another one hasn't yet formed. Exactly. Another question. Sir, at the front. My specific question to you is this, with respect to love's level lost and the clock which you mentioned. So I have been teaching Shakespeare for last more than 25 years in the university, students of Calcutta. That picture also like me, my name is Umesh Prashad Singh. I want to know about love's level lost, which you mentioned, the clock mentioning. And also I am very much fond of Shakespearean tragedies. You mentioned what, about what, what, what's your question, please, with love's, sir? Love's level lost and its clock elucidation, which you just mentioned, with respect to love's levels lost. Okay, thank you. We'll hold. Let's take a couple more questions and see which we want to come back to. Uh, there's a lady right there in the in the, uh, very elegantly dressed. I saw you this morning. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> she would she would be using a fork if she was at the theatre. <laughs> No oysters and nuts for her. <laughs> don't, don't drop that fork. Um, I thought they hid it in their doublets and hose, but anyway, that's a whole different lecture, I think, hiding forks and cutlery in the, in the doublet. Um, thank you for that, yet again, uh, illuminating talk. Um, my question was, as um, the audience is watching the heads on spikes from the north of the river, and then entering that beautiful image you created for us of going into this other theater, which is the map of an inner world. How much of, of the groundlings are either made conscious or become conscious of what's happening on the stage through Shakespeare's play? Is, is there any way of engaging with that? It's very difficult because, of course, the only people that write their response are the people that can write <laughs> um, and where it survived. So we've got really no direct evidence. I think what we do have is uh, very much evidence of the apprentices are politically very engaged. Um, the, and that's why the Coriolanus piece is so interesting because the apprentices in Shakespeare mount uh, a rebellion effectively in the 1590s and several of them are executed. So it's quite clear that some of those groundlings are very, very much engaged with that world and are taking it very seriously. And we know that also happens with Henry V, um, the, the hero coming back from France, which is about Essex, who was meant to come back from Ireland in triumph. We know that that's engaged. So I think, yes, the, 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 the apprentices, the, the, the groundlings, are very engaged. The, the, the police are always worried. There's no police. The state is always worried about the mob. Always. And that suggests that they are very engaged with these questions. And, and is, is it in Henry V when he goes walking before the battle and they're all talking about the king? And uh, is that right? Is, yeah. is that, that's what's so interesting in Henry V, the, the idea of the king wanting to know what the poor people think about him. Um, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Uh, one more here. This, yes, yes, with your hand up. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. and, then, and then to you behind, yes. Um, I had a question about, I mean, it's obvious that the Elizabethan man's world is very well reflected in Shakespeare's works, but is the world of the Elizabethan woman also equally well reflected in his work? And if so, in which specific work was it that we could see the Elizabethan woman's world being reflected in his work? Thank you. It's a good point. Um, uh, I, of course, I think you have to remember the whole society has been ruled by a woman. <laughs> Um, and Mary and Elizabeth, and they're real ruling it. 
Um, so the, the distinction is not nearly as extreme as it would be on the continent, where you don't have female rulers. Um, but I think you can see, I mean, Tim will know this, but I think you can certainly see in Much Ado About Nothing and in The Taming of the Shrew, the, the woman's role is very much taken, taken seriously. I mean, the, the women can fight back um, to some effect, <laughs> and not just the Lady Macbeths. Um, the, the, those two, I think, are very, very clearly about what a woman can achieve in quite a you know, quite a big and prosperous domestic setting. I don't agree with yes, that. and I, I'd only add that, of course, there's a massive gender imbalance in terms of representation. Of course, you count up the male characters, you count up the female characters, it speaks for itself. But compared to anything that had gone before in literature or theatre, the ability to speak truthfully about what was going on in women's minds and hearts and women's social position was still extraordinary and, and um, unprecedented. So I think it's it's something new again, even if it doesn't meet our... Also, I would just like to add that um, we've been offered a, 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 a genius insight today, but Shakespeare is not only a social realist, of course. He was bound by other things that we didn't talk about so much today, like the form of other literature that he's inheriting, myths and legends and other stories in which he's simply preserving the gender imbalance that was in, that, in those cast lists. You could call him lazy, but you could also call him clever. Keep the stories like they always were, and people will love it. Don't change it too much. He, he was commercial in the end. Uh, that, that, that lady there, yes, and then we're going to come to... Yes, yes. One last question. Well, we did start a little bit late, didn't we? To be fair on this audience who traipsed across from the lawn. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take... The, take, take three questions, one, two, three, and then we'll decide which we okay. answer, yes? If you keep it I, brief. I'm reciting a couplet. Thou in our wonder and astonishment hast it. built thyself a live-long monument. Okay, thank you. And uh, the lady here. Well, uh, the question I want to ask may seem very uh, simple or rather out of place, but uh, I want to ask about the language that... Uh, Shakespeare uses in his plays. Was it representative of the language used by the commoners at that time in England? Fantastic question. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's why it's so difficult for us to understand the comedy and the scenes when it is the, when, it, the, when they're humble people. And it, what's so interesting is the, the completely different languages within the play that obviously, I mean, in the Midsummer Night's Dream, Titania and Oberon speak grand, high, noble language, but the, the mechanicals speak exactly like the people in the street. And that's what's so interesting. This is, the, they're not only the people in the pit are on the stage, they're speaking like the people in the pit. But also what's brilliant is the people in the pit will be hearing the poetry. And of course, no one spoke in that poetry. They didn't go around speaking in iambic pentameter, I would imagine, every day. It's that Shakespeare's asking everything of all his audience, and they're all finding a way of accessing it. And that's the brilliance. And we mustn't dumb down. We mustn't think that in order to be accessible and contemporary, we have to reduce things. We have to demand of each other everything. We have to demand that the aristocrats understand the, the workers' speech and vice versa. This is, this is terribly important. Absolutely one last question, I promise. A short one with a short answer that will come. Who yes, shining uh, shock of white hair there. Lovely. Another elegant. Sorry, if elegance wins, I'm not a body fascist. Just, it, just, <laughs> it just sticks out. I'd like to ask a simple question. Do you happen to know what percentage of people could write at that time? Uh, very, very difficult to know, uh, but certainly more than ever before, because of the Protestant Reformation, grammar schools so that people can read the Bible, and that means to write. So in a London audience, yes, I think about 30, 40%. Thank you very much to you for making the session. Thank you to Neil.